I've just invited a gentleman to join Rania at this microphone, and I'll come to you at, uh, as you come up with questions so we can all hear. So who would like to comment or ask or a little bit sudden after the end of that rousing talk? I'm sorry, guys. I'm the sound guy, but I'm not just a sound guy. I was involved with ACT UP in the late 1980s. And this may be ethnocentric of me because I'm not African. I'm not African-American or Palestinian. But when I look at the rage and the, the consecutive killings, um, which I know is not a recent thing, and um, the cumulative grief, everything that I'm seeing, and when I saw Black Lives Matter arise, it, it was like watching act up um, all over again. And I'm watching even white Unitarians, some white Unitarians, some, um, I lost my train of thought. I know what it is. It's, it's saying, well, wh wh why are they interrupting Bernie Sanders? If they didn't interrupt Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, they wouldn't even be having the conversation. I see people that think it says only Black Lives Matter. No, it's Black Lives Matter. I knew the very briefly late Essex Hemphill was a black gay man came to my school, UMass. And either he or Marlon Riggs once said, as part of a work called Tongues Untied, black men loving black men mm -hmm. is the ultimate revolutionary act. And Essex looked at me and smiled and he said, you know, when some white gay and bisexual men heard that, they felt a little jilted because what they heard was black men copulating with black men was the ultimate revolutionary act. There's something about being white. There's a kind of a self-centeredness that kind of kicks in when you hear something like black lives matter. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopolize the conversation. I have gotta get back to work. Thank you. If, I, if I could just make, I don't think it's something about whiteness in particular. Um, I don't think the Irish folk that tried to escape the British occupation and the British forced starvation of Ireland when they came to Boston and to New York would feel white privilege when they were defined as white niggers in this country. I think it's the aspect of any community that identifies with the privileged class or seeks to identify with the privileged class. And some of them are people of color. Some of them are Uncle Tom's. So it's not intrinsic, I would argue, to whiteness. And I saw some of it in Lebanon when I moved back home. You know, it, it's, there's something intrinsic about being part of a system that is based on stepping on people's shoulders in order to make it to the top. And that kind of a system just justifies this kind of othering. And therefore, it breeds a kind of sensitivity when you say black lives matter, why my life does not matter, you know? Well, your life is doing pretty fine if you're identifying with the privileged class. You know, we need to break it up a, a lot more. Yeah, do the mic, please. Yeah, I, I think I'll say so. Um, well, I really want to touch on um, a point where when I became uh, active my junior year, um, I played soccer uh, and I had a, a large range of uh, white friends and when they began to see my post on Instagram and Facebook, they began to ask me, uh, uh, why do you hate white people? And of course, the all lives matter question. And of course, I responded, uh, all lives being taken by police, you know, um, all are you, are you systematically oppressed? And things like that. But I mean, I told them I, I, it's, it's not a hate for white people, it's a hate for white supremacy, you know? Um, it's a hate for uh, systematic oppression and seeing your people oppressed daily. Um, so, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, Ryan touched on it great. Hi, um, my name is Sundas. I'm a student at Chapel Hill, and I just have a question. Um, when I talk to people about the Black Lives Matter movement and tell them, uh, in my opinion, I think government should 
um, become more involved, they should enact policies or remove policies to help the African American community. I usually get a response that um, I don't agree with, but I don't know how to respond to about, well, what about black on black violence? What about um, the African Americans in their community who are in gangs or who hate those who go and succeed and leave that kind of stuff? Um, and I don't know how to respond to that. Uh, I don't agree with it, so I was just wondering what your take on that would be, or what your response would be, Bo both. Oh yeah, I hear that a lot, um, even from the black community. Uh, your response, we gotta stop killing each other, but then I say, well, what about the systematic and institutionalized racism that uh, impact our community daily? What about the lack of resources, lack of jobs, um, lack of housing, and things of that nature? And then once we, once we focus on a systematic issue and the cause of these uh, situations, then we can focus on maybe that. But I think once you, when you starve a community, um, when you starve people, uh, you starve a whole race of people, I mean, there's nothing really going on in the community, so things like that may happen. So that's, that's really what I have to say about it. I would, I would add something else to it. Even if what they say about black on black violence is true, which it isn't, that's no justification for state violence. And police brutality is state violence. And I always believe that state violence needs to be put on a much higher level of, of consequential treatment than individual violence. There's another problem that I'm seeing in this country, which I believe having an African-American president only made it worse, which is there's, there's, a, there's a sense that we live in a post-racial society. And it wasn't only Obama, I think, having you know, just him being president made it worse, but also Oprah made it a lot worse with her decades of talking about racism being individual problems. It's not. It's a state. It's an institutional system. So folks here think that we're no longer living in separate but equal. We are living still in separate but equal because we can talk about housing discrimination by bank loans. We can talk about housing discrimination um, by access to homes, by access to school. I mean, there's institutional racism that is still embedded in this country, be it in the economic system, be it in the school system, be it in the jail system, be it in the voting system, be it in so many aspects. And until people understand that and they recognize that just having Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice and Barack Obama in power does not mean we're in a post-racial society. And if, for the record, I would not be, should not be getting my vote. If Hillary Clinton gets to be president, that does not mean the war against women has been won in no way, shape, or form. So, you know, again, it's not tokenism that's going to bring us liberation. It's an institutional dismantling of the system that we need. Nor do I want Bernie Sanders, just for the record. I just want to ask, who do you think should be teaching uh, the future police uh, so that they have a different approach? Uh, well, I'm an advocate for community control over the police. I'm an advocate for us policing our own communities because historically we've seen that uh, police have not been in favor of the betterment and liberation of our communities. So I think police community, uh, building that, because we have a relationship with our own community, so that will put us in a better situation and how to, you know, things like that. I would take it to a whole other step. And I say if we want the police to behave better, we've got to disarm them. And I'm being very serious about this. I don't see... Right now, the police are no, no, they're not even armed as police, they're armed as military soldiers. And something happens to the psyche of an individual when they get dressed that way. They get dressed immediately in that gear, they're immediately thinking that the community is the enemy. And it makes it worse when the community is being presented by the media as the enemy. So let's disarm them. And let's disarm them and let's recognize why, you know, tie again police brutality to the prison industrial complex because there, there's a direct system right there. Disarm them, make sure there's zero impunity, Actually, what would it look like if we build jails for the cops? You know, I mean, what, how would that change the, the police behavior if they know they can't get away with it rather than getting paid suspensions? Okay. Um, 
Yeah. I guess with the microphone. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, thank you so much. This was a brilliant talk. And uh, I'm making video, so hopefully the video will be available soon after I give it to Jerry Marketos. But I want to thank you, uh, the speakers. Uh, we have been working on this issue through an organization called Mary M Movement on Racism and Islamophobia. And, and we totally agree with the analysis that uh, even as a Palestine activist, we have to recognize the condition that, they are t uh, that the speakers are talking about. Uh, it's, it's, it's beyond police uh, just looking in, in a microscopic manner, but looking at the level of colonialism in America. That's, that's what's happening. If, if we look at the condition of African American, the black population, it's a, it's a situation of occupation. It's a situation of colonialism. In Ferguson, they're using the same uh, uh, tear gas as they are uh, uh, shooting in, um, in, in Gaza. And, and when you have 10% African American population but makes 46% of the prison population, we say this is a situation of colonialism. That, 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 and this is a situation of occupation. There are more African Americans who are incarcerated today than blacks who were enslaved at the height of slavery. If we do not recognize that, we don't really understand the connection between Palestine and the black liberation movement. So we totally agree, and we don't see Baltimore or Ferguson as riots. We see them as rebellions. Yes. We see them as uprising, as intifada. And I think that's how we can connect uh, in, uh, international solidarity uh, with the Palestine struggle. And uh, we would be honored to work with you all with uh, an organization that I mentioned, Mary, Jerry Marcotes, thank you so much for joining. And we would like to continue after your talk is done that we really need to organize in our own communities to fight the oppression. Thank you. In the case, you mentioned the state, in the case of a state or federal worker who is required to implement a policy that he considers unwise, we understand. He grits his teeth and he follows orders. Would you have anything to say to a state or federal officer who is called on to implement a policy that he considers to be illegal? Well, I believe that the highest law is the law of one's conscience. And that's the law that we should be listening to, our conscience. Um, and I also look that we have political, prisoner, the political prisoners in this country who have violated federal law, including Private Chelsea Manning, who's now facing solitary confinement for possibly 50 years. Now, many of us may not have her courage, but I believe that's what we need to be calling for. You know, laws that are unjust, that are criminal, that are unethical, it should be our responsibility to violate them. We're not going to get changes in this country or any other country. How to put this politely? We can't get revolutions from writing petitions. We can't get a revolution from meeting with our congressmen and our congresswomen who Yale has to, Yale not the Malcolm X grassroots movement, but Yale has told us this country is no longer a democracy, but an oligarchy. Donald Trump has told us this country is no longer a democracy. But yet we still meet with our congressional representatives and give them petitions and think they're going to change foreign policy when they're being paid to maintain it, think they're going to change domestic policy when they're being paid to maintain it. You know, we're told to vote, voting's coming up as if that voting for the primaries. With... I don't know what the path will be, but I know when we look at historically in this country, we are not going to get revolution, which is basically what I and many of my comrades are asking for through petitions and four-year or two-year voting and pleading and being nice. What does the other pathway look like? I don't know, but I sure hope that there are serious conversations taking place in this country about what that different pathway would look like and what kind of a real mass movement and building of a movement would look like rather than small, six-month, nine-month organizing techniques and organizing protests, but build for the long term, for the real long term. I think that's what's needed in this country. Just like in our struggle for the liberation of Palestine, we know BDS is not going to liberate Palestine. As critical as BDS is, alone, it won't liberate Palestine. Equipped and supporting armed resistance within the territories, and equipped and supporting Palestinian sovereignty and Palestinians speaking for themselves, it may, 
Particularly if we in Palestine dismantle the Palestinian Authority, then we take that struggle a step forward. So there's, there's, there's a relationship there. You know, for us here knowing Obama has not brought us closer to liberation. And for us in Palestine to know having dozens and dozens of countries, quote, recognize the state of Palestine, to me, is an insult to my country and my people. You know, recognizing where the Uncle Toms are. And yes, building the support networks to encourage people of conscience to take that very, very courageous stand, which means right now supporting Chelsea Manning as much as we can to liberate her from being a political prisoner in this country. Um, I just want to point out about Chelsea Manning that over 100,000 petitions went in, which in fact now has reversed her solitary confinement. So I think resistance needs to be elevated. I think you're right, the movement needs to be advanced. I think we need to probably something for everyone to do, not just talking to people in this group, but reaching out and really creating space so people who haven't acted at all, for them a petition may be an act of resistance. So I think you're right, the search goes on and we need, but the most important is resistance. I really wanted to talk to Ajama because I'm concerned and I'd, Rania, I'd like your, your piece as well and I'm glad we have a video because I think it should be in our schools. So I wanted to ask you, what efforts have you found successful or especially with youth, young people that you've been part of and now moving I think into Central, how do we get, for many of us here, working on the Chapel Hill Carborough School District district, transforming curriculum because our young people are not studying history through a racial lens. They're not studying history through oppression, as Manzu was stating earlier. So I just wondered if you had um, how to work together and what you have found successful in really moving school systems and teachers, many of whom feel intimidated, by the way, and not protected, to really have courageous conversation in the classroom. So I just wondered if you'd give us your experience and some advice that we can take with us in our own school district here and beyond. Okay. Um. Well, in terms of school districts and um, informing about the school to prison pipeline, uh, we've had a little gain, but keeping constant pressure on um, the, the school board, uh, keeping constant pressure on the principals and the teachers, and engaging in that conversation in classrooms is key. Uh, even if the conversation, uh, even if the teacher doesn't want it to be there, uh, making it there. Uh, really uh, enforcing your beliefs and talking about liberation is key. But in terms of history, uh, moving the school system uh, in terms of history, and my grandma's been in the school system for a while, and she's been in efforts of trying to uh, enforce uh, like the true black history. Um, it has been a struggle, but we must hold the community accountable to teaching uh, our young people about the history of their people in this country and beyond. Um, and as I go into North Carolina Central, um, I don't know how it will be on the college campus in terms of organizing, but uh, I hope to maybe uh, do workshops in terms of talking about uh, Black Lives Matter, workers' rights, and things of that nature, and um, just try and whatever comes to mind is, is, is really key, but I, I feel as if we uh, build a community and reach out to young people in a, in, a, in a positive way, we could really have effective change and really move some minds. With that, we have copies of the statement, if any of you have yet to read the 2015 Black Solidarity Statement with Palestine. We've got a few copies, so I'll just be putting them on the table, you know, if you haven't yet gotten a copy. They're still going to be raising signatures, I believe. Um, okay. Blackforpalestine.com, which is basically... Um, that's the tweet. Great. Well, let's give our speakers a hand. Great. Thank you so much.